let's start with the latest news that we've learned in this NATO summit. The United States decided to send long-range missiles to Germany. This is huge. This is so important right now at this stage of the conflict in Ukraine. And they're talking, it seems that they want to continue this conflict in Ukraine. And the question would be in the mind of many people, will there be a Ukraine by 2026? <laughs> well, that is a question. And uh, so in one sense, this can be uh, can be a little bit uh, ephemeral, but it's real enough. And what it means is that, uh, well, as one writer wrote this morning, uh, the collective West is losing their minds collectively. Um, there were peace structures, disarmament structures, arms control structures in place. And now the West has not only uh, destroyed them, gotten out of them, but are now creating worse situations with the same kinds of missiles, for example, in this case, that were destroyed under the in Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty that lasted 32 years. So this seems all very gratuitous and it's interesting in several respects. Now, what we have, I should make clear, is something that was put out uh, on the second of the three-day NATO summit here in Washington. And um, it was very bizarre because it was not a NATO document or a NATO decision. It was a bilateral agreement between the United States and Germany. And that was made clear in the release. It's only one paragraph. I think I owe it to our viewers to, to read the, the paragraph without any editorial comment. Quote, Following discussions ahead of the ahead of the NATO summit, uh, the governments of the United States and Germany released the following joint statement. Uh, the day was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, July ten. Okay. Quote: The U.S. Uh, will begin episodic deployment of the long-range uh, missiles capable of its multiple domain task force in Germany in 2026. So episodic, I guess that means temporary here and there, maybe a couple times a year, not clear. Yeah, but this is part of planning for an enduring, like not temporary, but enduring. They don't say permanent anymore, they say enduring. An enduring stationing of these capabilities in the future. When fully developed, these conventional long-range fire units, missiles, will include SAM, surface to air missiles, Tomahawk, and developmental hypersonic weapons. Now, Tomahawk is nuclear capable. Uh, the developmental uh, hypersonic missiles refer to people refer to missiles that have not been developed yet. In other words, Russia has them, China has them, Iran has them, but we haven't been able to perfect the hypersonic missiles yet. So they're developmental uh, uh, hypersonic missiles. Now, all these have a significantly longer range than the current current missiles based in Europe. Now, we know a lot about the missiles that are in Ukraine. What most people don't remember is that they're also in Romania and Poland and have been there for years. In Romania, I think they've been there since 2016. Uh, and uh, we just heard at the NATO meeting that the installation of these same sites has com been completed in Poland. We could talk more about that later. Okay, so they have a significantly larger range, longer range than the current missiles in Europe. Exercising these advanced capabilities will demonstrate the United States commitment to NATO and its contributions to European integrated deterrence. Now, I don't know 
what the United States has on uh, Scholz, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of, of Germany. But if I were Olaf Scholz, I would be really reluctant uh, to go back on a treaty that his predecessors welcomed because those Russian SS-20 missiles had Germany right in their sights. And the deal was back in 1987 that we would give up the Pershing II missiles, which had lots of Russia in its sights, and then Russia would give up the SS-20s. Now, when I first heard that proposal, this was in the middle of Reagan's second term. I said, well, that's never happened before. That's not going to happen. They're not going to destroy a whole class of uh, nuclear missiles. But long story short, they agreed to. Uh, Reagan came to us and said, can you verify if we trust? You know, doverai, no proverai. And we said yes. And our good friend Scott Ritter ended up going up to this god awful place called Votkinsk uh, to make sure that for two years he stayed there with the uh, Russian and, and other, of course, Americans there to verify that this treaty, the provisions of this treaty were being, being uh, adhered to. Uh, Scott recently, re recently wrote that, uh, you know, he was really really saddened that a good bulk of his professional life, a good bulk of it, uh, was uh, was shred, shredded to, to, to nothing. Uh, that treaty uh, concluded by, by concluded actually in 87. Uh, uh, Gorbachev was amenable to it. It lasted until uh, President Trump decided, for whatever reason, to leave it. That was in 2019. Now, Nima, I, I happen to know how, uh, how, how Scott feels because I have the same situation with respect to an earlier treaty, which was called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Um, when I became head of the uh, Soviet Foreign Policy Branch at CIA, uh, we were engaged, three of my, my staffers, three of the people on my staff, were engaged with the uh, negotiations, whether they were in Helsinki or, uh, or in Vienna, uh, with the delegation, supporting them with intelligence. And then finally, uh, I got to go to Moscow to, for the signing. It was May, 1972. Uh, it was such a relief and such a, a welcome event that we agreed to destroy all the ABM, all the anti-ballistic missiles, uh, that we had installed, except two, okay? And then except one, we said one was enough because one couldn't possibly, two couldn't possibly defend a country. So there was a, like an extreme disincentive, you might say, for one country to think that they could mount a first strike on another country and escape immediate and devastating retaliation. And that kept the peace. So that was, you know, a reign of terror, a balance of terror, if you will, but it was a balance. And then uh, George W. Bush, in his wisdom in 2002, uh, got out of that. And, uh, and that made no sense at all because uh, that ended uh, three decades of that kind of stability. Uh, I did the math with respect to the uh, INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and that was 32 years. So, so Scott feels two years worse than I do about what's happened to, to arms control. Now, let me get back to this very curious statement, because there's lots more to be said about it. Uh, I made a whole bunch of notes here. Uh, what's in, in play here uh, are launcher systems called Typhon sort of like Typhoon, but Typhon uh, erector launches. Now, they're great big capsules for the 40 feet long, and they're, they're mobile, okay? That's the big thing. Uh, they're carried by these huge trucks, or they could be carried by rail, of course, probably some of these very big, large cargo planes. Uh, but they're mobile, and that makes them different. Why different from what? 
different from the from the capsules that are installed already in uh, Romania and now in Poland. And so they can be moved around. And how did these first come to our attention? From Putin. Um, he's speaking now on the 28th of June. So we have the 10th of July when the statement, U.S. German statement was uh, was revealed, it was announced. So my math is right, 10, 12, 12 days earlier, Putin called a, a, an assistatious meeting of his National Security Council. Uh, these don't happen all that much, in my view. And he may name the permanent members of the Security Council. And he said, uh, look, um, in 2019, we announced that we would not produce the kinds of missiles that the Americans now say uh, they're going to do. They're going to actually deploy in Germany. We said, even though the U.S. canceled its participation in this treaty, that we wouldn't produce them and we wouldn't deploy them as long as the United States did, as long as the United States did not deploy them anywhere else around the globe. We know now, says Putin, that the United States is not only producing these missile systems, but has brought them to Europe, Denmark to be specific, to use in exercises. Not long ago, it was reported that they're in the Philippines as well. It's not clear whether they have taken these missiles out of the Philippines or not. Well, after Putin made that statement, the Philippines made it very clear that they were just here for an exercise. They were going right back <laughs> in just one month. Okay, Denmark? I don't know. Well, final here for from Putin at this National Security Council meeting. In any case, we need to respond to this and decide on our further steps in this regard. It appears that we need to begin producing these attack systems, and then based on the actual situation, uh, well, then we have to decide on whether to deploy them uh, to ensure our security if necessary. So again, the timing is interesting. 28th of June is when he said that at a major National Security Council meeting. So it's 12 days later that uh, uh, I can only assume that Blinken and Sullivan got the uh, Germans to agree, look, we can't bring all the NATO members in on this. They, they don't want these things in their country, but let's put them in Germany. And then we have this joint statement. Yep, they're going in. They're going in uh, episodically in 2016, assuming, as you mentioned, that there still is a Ukraine then. And then they'll go in in an enduring matter, which uh, sort of we used to say permanent. Okay, so what is this all about? It's crazy. I mean, we have this. Ray, you mean 2026? 2026. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. You right? said 2016. So, yeah, just yeah. Just to mention, I have one of those. You know, I'm I'm older than President Biden. You know, so <laughs> I. I, I but you're so sharp. <laughs> Well, thanks for catching me on that. Nobody catches Biden and uh, and Vice President Putin. No, Vice President Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I wish that all that all were funny. Anyhow, yeah, uh, 2026. So that's two years away. Is this academic? No. Why are they doing this? The well, Russians already said, look, we're going to respond in a very cool and calculating military way and we can respond and we have the ability to do that so is this collective insanity well it's i don't know if there's a better word for it uh, what's the u.s trying to do show how tough we are how devoted to nato and the germans uh, are able to be persuaded to do this even though we destroyed their pipeline and, and their economy in the, in the process. So that's another uncertainty. How do the Germans agree to all this? And so going into the November election, um, Blinken and Sullivan could say, look, we, uh, we're we not only doing this, we're not only have uh, these missiles 
in Poland and Romania. Now we're going to put them in Germany. And if you look at the map, Germany is farther away from Russia, but you know they'll be far range and they'll be hypersonic after we develop hypersonic missiles. So when the U.S. and Germany say that they'll be longer range and more effective than the missiles that are already in Europe, they must be referring not only to those missiles that are in, in Ukraine, but also to the ones in, in Poland and Romania. And that, that is uh, you know, a real thorn in the side of the, the Russian leaders. Uh, just to remind you that uh, this is a major factor in their, deci their decision to go ahead and intervene in Ukraine. Putin sending his troops in on the 24th of, of February. 2022. So what we have here is, is kind of a situation where um, needless irritants have been sort of offered up and uh, given to the Russians to deal with. Um, I would also remind your viewers, our viewers, uh, that on December 30th, uh, uh, Putin's people called the White House and said, look, uh, President Putin wants to talk to President Biden right away. Well, uh, what was that all about? Well, I think if you reconstruct what happened just a little while before, it was on the 21st of December that Putin warned his generals and his admirals that, look, you know, we have these missile sites in Romania and Poland. Uh, they can they can reach Moscow or ICBM sites in 10 minutes. And once they get hypersonic missiles, five minutes, okay? That's what we're dealing with. So what happened? That was the 21st of December. On the 30th, Kremlin calls, Putin wants to talk to Mr. Biden like right away. Now to his credit, uh, Biden took the call. And what was really interesting is that he was in Delaware. Where was Blinken? Christmas shopping. Where was Biden? I don't know, but they weren't with him. Okay, so here is the president all by himself. Okay, so he takes the call and Putin says, look, you know, just nine days ago, I reminded my generals and admirals that, you know, these missile sites you have in Poland and, and Romania, bad enough. Uh, that uh, you know they can reach us with hypersonic missiles when you get them in five minutes. And they say, well, for God's sake, uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich, do something about it. We're afraid they're going to put them in Ukraine. And as I understand it, I wasn't a fly on the wall, but look at the results. What happened was uh, Putin said to Biden, now look, this is a legitimate concern of ours to so put yourself in our place. Do you think that you could, just to get our talks off to a good start, start at Geneva on the 9th of January, do you think that you could reassure me that you're not going to put those missiles in Ukraine? And all we know is the readout, and the readout says, President Biden said that the U.S. has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period. End quote. And there was great rejoicing in Moscow that New Year's Eve, the day later, and for the days following, until Lavrov, the foreign minister, met with Blinken three weeks later on the 21st of January and said, OK, let's start talking about banning the, such missiles from Ukraine. And Blinken said, wait, talk about that. That, 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 that. Forget about it. We're not going to do that. We have a right to put them in Ukraine. Um, maybe we talk about how many we're putting them in. No, 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 no. So you could understand that Putin and others felt pretty much double-crossed on that one, or at least deceived. And that was only these uh, missiles that are already in place in Romania and, and Poland being being extended to Ukraine. Ukraine, of course, is closer to, to Russia, so it would have been even more a big threat. So they placed place great importance on all this. And all I can say is that in listening, listening to what the Germans and the U.S. agreed to, outside of the NATO umbrella here, this is a joint agreement. And, and you know, 
the Russians have historic reasons to not like the Germans. I won't go into explain all that, but they did lose 26 million people in World War II. A lot of them remember that. So this is just an unneeded irritant designed, in my view, just to make the U.S. feel really strong and say, look, we have these missiles. We're going to use them. We're going to put them in Germany to make sure that we face down Putin and don't let him win in Ukraine. And then, of course, the rest of the story, uh, far from it was exactly a year ago, I think Jan July 8th or so, where Biden got up in Helsinki and said, Putin has already lost in Ukraine. He's had a strategic defeat it went one year ago, okay? So, well, that wasn't quite right, was it? Okay, well, what's going to happen now when they realize that it's not Putin is going to lose in Ukraine, but it's Ukraine and NATO? Uh, or still, of course, we have the election in the United States coming. That's just a couple months away now. Uh, what will happen, you know? What will happen if Putin decides, well, all right, these guys are incorrigible. They're threatening me in new ways. I'm going to go all the way and take Kiev or surround it or just do something that will really embarrass the Biden regime before they go to the polls, uh, whatever regime happens to be in place at the time. So that's very dangerous because, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, um, when they run out of ammunition, like 155 millimeter shells, they looked for on the shelf and they found cluster munitions. Well, let's use those. The president says, I don't know, those are, aren't they banned by most countries in the world? Yeah, but that's all we got. Well, okay. You're, so we're just out of all shells. Okay, how about, how about the, the allies? They have some shells? No, they have some shells. No, I don't know. Okay, uh, so cluster munition. Now, that's sort of a, an analogy I would draw. What happens when we're out of cluster munitions? When we're out of any way to, to stave off a definitive Russian defeat in Ukraine, and the election has not yet come. I'm deathly afraid that these same people will turn to, to uh, Biden, if he's still around, and say, Mr. President, uh, uh, not only have the Russians not lost in Ukraine, but it looks like we are. And here it is just a month before the election. We have to do something dem demonstrative to stop this. I said, well, what would that be? Well, we're at, a, we're at ammunition and we used up even all those cluster things. Uh, but we have these uh, low yield uh, uh, mini nukes, we call them. Uh, we can dial them down to, you know, just a third of the, of the explosive uh, 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 explosiveness of, of the uh, Hiroshima and the Nagasaki things. It's, so that would teach them a lesson. That would turn things around. And, that, you know, we don't really have any alternative to losing big in Ukraine, losing big in the election, and then, you know, maybe losing our freedom if that opponent comes in and, 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 and thinks he has the goods on us. You know, he could just send us to jail. So, now, do I put it beyond his advisors to suggest that to him? I don't. And that's a terrible thing to say. Yeah? But for the first time in my professional life, and that goes back five decades, okay, I'm very afraid that the riskiness, the, um, the, 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 the inability of these young people, comparatively speaking, compared to Biden and me, uh, would uh, would take this kind of risk and risk open war with with Russia, and not only Russia. I mean, you have Chinese troops exercising in Belarus as we speak. Chinese troops. I mean, <laughs> that's not been heard of in a long time. Chinese troops going anywhere but in China. But what's that all about? Well, Belarus is now part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They give a new perspective to Eurasia uh, as part of this organization. And the Chinese are making a statement here saying, look, we're in this on the side of Russia and on Belarus. So 
please don't don't think that you can uh, cause trouble in Europe and expect nothing to happen in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Straits. We're in this together. It's two against one. And here's a token of how devoted we are to this principle of two against one. We're sending our own troops to Belarus. I don't remember the Chinese sending troops anywhere except for a brief, brief uh, uh, thing into uh, Vietnam back in '79 or something like that. So that's unprecedented. So uh, we're in a, a big fix now, and uh, Ukraine is in the forefront, and the president is not getting good advice. And Boston, the, the military, you know, they're, they're saying, well, you know, whatever Blinken and Sullivan say, witness the fact that early in the war, um, I remember when Blinken was in Moldova and he said, we're going to send uh, NATO aircraft in to, to make sure that the Ukrainians uh, don't lose. And uh, the Pentagon said, no, you're not. <laughs> And there were all kinds of other people uh, in the administration. Oh, yeah, well, we're going to do that. And the Pentagon said, no, you're not. And the Pentagon somehow got to to Biden and persuaded him, look, that would be World War III. Biden got up and said, that would be World War III, you know? And so we're not going to do it. Well, what about F F-16s now? Well, uh, Blinken... Uh, during the NATO summit, got up and said, "Ah, they'd be flying there this summer." Where we get Norway, not Norway, but Dan Denmark, and all kinds of Netherlands, and then we're gonna we're gonna fly those F-16s. And you better watch out, okay? Well, Russia's already made clear that since the F-16s are nuclear capable, they're gonna be shot out of the sky or they're gonna be shot on their air airfields from which they take off. And there aren't too many airfields in Ukraine that can accommodate F-16. So what happens if before the election, F-16s fly out of Moldova or out of uh, uh, Romania or Poland? What's gonna happen? Well, the Russian Air Force is capable of downing them but uh, they're also capable of retaliating against the airfields from which these things flew. And Putin himself has made it clear that that would be a likely result. So why are they tempting fate here? Why, why can't they just say, well, wait a second. Uh, how are we doing in Ukraine? Is there any chance we can prevail? And when they ask Austin that, uh, he has a, a big reputation of falsifying intelligence judgments to satisfy his superiors. That's why he's, he got four stars, okay? He falsified information on Syria when he was head of CENTCOM. That's proven 51 intelligence analysts, not only at CENTCOM where he was commander, but in the Defense Intelligence Agency filed an Inspector General report against Austin for doing precisely that. So do you think he's going to stand up to Blinken or Sullivan when they say, no, nah, no, we're going to do this or that to include a nuclear weapon? Well, maybe maybe the Joint Chiefs will stand up, but even that is not guaranteed. Uh, but as I usually say, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what Putin thinks. And he's got generals and admirals to deal with. Uh, I'm sure that they put him up to getting that telephone call with with Biden and getting what they thought was a commitment not to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, which was reneged upon. What will they do this time? You know, what will these admirals and generals do uh, as uh, Putin continues his attrition, attrition, attrition? Will they be putting a lot of pressure on him to teach the West a lesson? Well, yeah, they will be. And lots of people in Moscow will Will Putin riding high, winning definitively in Ukraine and feel pressure to do that? Will he feel some pressure? Will he succumb to it? I don't believe so. But, you know, what I believe is, is not always uh, what turns out to be the case. They're taking this very hard. They're coming out with strong statements, even though we're talking, you know, 2026, as you pointed out. Okay. 
still, that's not far off. Uh, it's more the idea of reneging on the inter uh, Intermediate Nat uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty. And not only that, but saying, oh, we're going to put in more sophisticated, more long range, more hypersonic missiles when we get them into Germany. Now, I don't know how the Germans are going to react to that, but uh, so far, uh, they've, uh, you know, they've just been sort of slavishly obedient. I'm reminded, maybe I'll end on this note, I'm reminded of the of that cartoon where you have a bunch of lemmings right at the precipice, you know, and uh, one turns to the other, the caption, and one turns to the other and says, uh, do we really have to do this? Everybody else is jumping off the cliff, right? And the other fellow says, well, if we don't do this, we would be untrue to the tradition of all the lemmings that went before us. <laughs> well, that's what seems to have been the case in, uh, in the NATO summit, and especially with respect to Germany. And, you know, not to be conspiratorial, but I wonder what they have on charts, you know? I mean, the intelligence agencies had very good information, all German politicians of whatever uh, influence. Why Schultz behaves the way he does? Uh, he's not the very brightest guy in the world, but my God, you would think that he would show more sense than let himself be dragooned into this when the rest of his neighbors in NATO apparently turned Sullivan and blinking down on this one. Ray, the other thing that was so bold in this NATO summit was that Stoltenberg was talking about China. He said that the reason that Russia is doing well right now is China. Let's that's why we are inviting Australia, New Zealand, and Japan and South Korea in order to send a message to China. And the other thing that was so amazing was a report that shows 40% of all semiconductors for the weapons in the United States are produced in China. It's unbelievable, Ray, how they can put these pictures together and reach a conclusion that they want to fight China. Again, it's, uh, it's beyond the imagination. You know, you would think that if they want to take on Russia, that the last thing they would do would be to alienate China. But, you know, maybe the key is in what Biden himself says every time he gets up with some prepared script. And that is, he says, we are the sole exceptional, sole indispensable country in the world. Madeleine Albright was right. He says that. He says that almost every time. Now, I didn't think, well, I didn't know whether he really believed that or not, okay? Uh, but then I got a report from a small little living room session he had with people up in New Hampshire about seven months ago. And uh, the report was, yeah, he really, he, he stressed this in a small circle. He tried to show us how, how you know, we are so indisp indispensable and everything. And so, so apparently he believes that. Now, Blinken, Sullivan, I mean, they believe it too, maybe. Or at least they, they say, well, if the president believes that, maybe it's our, you know, we will be in the coattails of this great indispensability. But it's dead wrong. And what it leads to, I mean, take Madeleine Albright. She was there. She was... She was Clinton's Secretary of State and also ambassador to the UN. Clinton, of course, was the one that decided to violate the promise that Secretary of State James Baker made to Gorbachev and Shevardnadze in February of 1990, not to move uh, NATO one inch to the east. So she was a big advisor on that because Clinton started doing precisely that. She also was responsible for very weird sanctions that left 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five 
dead. Okay. Now, we kind of knew that. Uh, and uh, it was generally known, but she was braced on that by, a, by an interviewer called Leslie Stahl. And you may remember that it was very, it did go around. This one did get some publicity because it was so horrendous. Uh, Leslie Stahl says, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, you talk about prevailing against uh, Iraq and the rest of the Middle East, but 500,000 500, Iraqi children under the age of five dead because of the, the sanctions that you're insisting are a good thing? Do you, th can, do you think that's worth it? And Alan uh, Albright said, yes, we believe it's worth it. Yep, we, we go, we do. Okay. So this is the paradigm that uh, Bush, that Biden is uh, modeling himself about. Whatever it takes, it's worth it. And you know what's going on in Gaza? Why does he stop that genocide? Why does he stop all those little kids from getting killed? It's worth it. Somebody tells him it's worth it. So, so um, what what is seen by the rest of the world is really uh, poignant because, as you can imagine, not many countries other than the slaves in Western Europe and the UK, of course, uh, like to identify themselves with that kind of policy. And uh, you know, when you when you pursue this kind of thing, then people can call you out on it and get a certain resonance. And that's precisely what President Putin did. Now, this is sort of interesting. So I'm going to refresh some memories here. Uh, back in 2013, there was a, uh, uh, a surprise attack by sarin gas in house near near Damascus, okay, turned out to be a, a false flag, but we we couldn't be sure of that at the time, okay. And so what happened was very briefly, uh, there was lots of pressure on uh, Obama to strike out militarily in an open way, not just a covert way against Syria. And by chance, he was due to be up in Saint Petersburg for a G eight summit, okay. So he went up there the first week of September 2013, and Putin surprised him. Now, another thing was that Obama didn't have Secretary Kerry with him. Yeah. So he didn't have to feel, whoa, wait a second, you know, I'm encumbered by this. Anyhow, he meets with Putin. Putin says, you know, Mr. President, I appreciate uh, your willingness uh, or your, uh, your unwillingness to start another war. I think that's a good thing. I can help you out. And Obama says, how can you do that? He says, well, look, we talked to the Syrians, okay? We have agreed that they will destroy, destroy all their chemical weapons uh, under UN supervision on a, on a ship outfitted for such destruction. You have a couple of those ships if you'll allow that. And that will end that problem. You won't have to make war on Syria. <laughs> and uh, Obama said, Really? And Putin said, you know, I'm sorry this is a surprise to you, but we don't trust Kerry. The day Obama arrived in St. Petersburg, I think it was the 3rd of September, 2013, Mr. Putin went on TV and said about John Kerry, on vriot, on snayet stovriot, Okay. He lies. He knows he's lying. This is really sad. <laughs> Obama touches down to that kind of welcome. Now, it was true. Kerry knew that we weren't winning in Syria. He knew that was a false flag. He blamed Bashar al-Assad 35 times in one speech, knowing that it was a false flag. And he wanted a war against Syria, just like all the other neocons. Okay, so what happened? Well, Obama said, "How can I know that the Syrians will do this?" And Putin said, "Well, watch the foreign minister tomorrow. He's going on TV, and he said, come to this this deal." And Obama said, "Oh, that, that's really really good news." So he goes back to Washington, 
relieved that he alone, among all his entourage, resisted the notion of hitting Syria offensively, overtly. And, uh, and sure enough, the Syrian foreign minister gets up and says that, and Obama calls John Kerry. Now, where is John Kerry? He's in London, right? What's he doing in London? He's appealing for support to get the president to do, do what he has to do, what he said he would do. He set a red line a year ago, and now he's going to hit Syria, right? And then at the end of this little press conference, and this is just three days after Putin and, and, and Obama had been talking and agreed, at this press conference, uh, Jen, John Kerry has asked, well, Secretary Kerry, he was Secretary of State, is there, is there nothing that Bashar al-Assad could do to, to save himself from being attacked? And Kerry says, well, I suppose he, he could destroy all his chemical weapons, but that's not going to happen. That, that's not in the cards. <laughs> so Obama gets on the phone. Calls Kerry as Kerry's coming home to Washington. He said, John, I have something important to tell you. I want you to see in your office as soon as you get in. And so he gets to the office, and of course, Obama breaks the news. Look, we have got a deal. We're going to get them to destroy all the nuclear weapons. Okay. How are you how are going to do that? Well, not the nuclear weapon, the chemical weapon. How are you going to do that? Well, under verification, we already, already have UN inspectors ready to do it. And we're going to use one of the ships, the Admiral so-and-so said we could use, okay? So Kerry, <laughs> Kerry was a little bit nonplussed and embarrassed as hell since he had tried to get the British to support us when the president had already decided that war could be avoided. What's the point of all this stuff? All, all this stuff is that if a president is alone and, and not not overheard or not overly coached by his entourage, they make sensible decisions, as Obama did in the early week of September 2013, and as uh, uh, as other other presidents have done. Uh, in the, that was going to adduce one other example. It escapes me right now, but sensible decisions can be made. Uh, like, oh yeah, I was going to when. When uh, Putin called Biden uh, in his Delaware home, uh, he was, <laughs> it's really interesting. You have to look at all this stuff. You have to see what Sullivan said as a, as a spokesman and you know, who was with him. Well, we don't know who was with him. And, you know, so he was clearly alone. So presidents can do that. Now, one thing that I mentioned this episode in September of 2013 was because uh, Putin wrote an op-ed for the New York Times on the 12th of September, just a couple of days after the agreement was reached with Obama that the Syrians would destroy their chemical weapons. And what he said was, I am very happy with the renewed trust, trust, the key to the realm, okay? Trust between not only our governments, U.S. and Russia, but between Mr. Obama and me, personally. We can build on that trust. We just prevented a war. Let's build on that trust. The only thing that I disagree strongly with President Biden, uh, President Obama is that uh, just last week he made a speech and he said that the U.S. was the sole exceptional country in the world. I don't, don't think that's right, says as Putin. I learned later, by the way, that he penned in or typed out that last paragraph of this op in himself. Okay, Putin did. And what it said was, I don't agree, Putin. I don't agree with this notion of, of uh, exceptionalism. I think it's wrong to give any country the idea that it's head and shoulders about others. After all, we have all kinds of countries in the world. We have rich and poor. We have those who are close to democracy and others far away from democracy. But in the final analysis, when the good, good Lord looks at the world and all these countries, he considers them all equal. All countries are created equal. <laughs> Men are created equal. That's what, 
that's what he has to finish us up this this op-ed, okay? Waxing eloquent about the new trust, but cautioning, God, this is not this is a very mischievous notion. Well, sure enough, I mean the, the proof was in the pudding. What happened? Well, that was September 2013. In February 2014, so about a half year later, there was a coup in Kiev, financed and directed by by U.S. special services and allied special services, overthrowing the relatively pro-Russian, duly elected uh, president of, of Ukraine, putting in uh, people that were named. Uh, uh, we knew who they were. They were Madeleine. They were uh, uh, the people that were, were named by uh, Victoria Nuland in her conversation with the U.S. ambassador in Kiev. Uh, and uh, it was so blatant, okay? Now, at the same time, Nuland uh, bragged about having given five billion, with a B, dollars to Ukraine's aspirations to join the West, okay? So what am I saying here? It just took one half a year, six months, uh, that to, to undermine this concept of trust between these two superpowers and to make it so that there couldn't be any trust. And that was February 22nd. 2014, right away, they said, we're going to join NATO, that is the new installed puppet regime. Right away, they said, we're going to clean out the Russian speaking area and make sure that they don't speak with, that Russia would not be a, a, an official language anymore. And then there was all kinds of deceptions with respect to international agreements, whereby the people in the Donbass and other parts of, of uh, Ukraine that were primarily Russian stock would be given some degree of local autonomy. Those all were sworn to by the French, by the by the Germans and others, and and they came to naught. And not only that, but to to rub uh, rub into the eyes of the of the Russians. Uh, they said, "Well, this was just really kind of a a, a delaying tactic. We wanted to train up." Ukrainian troops, and we had all this time now that we deceived people thinking that the Minsk Accords would work. Well, they were not designed. They were designed to give us time to build up the Ukrainian army, to give it weaponry from NATO and train it up to NATO standards. The head of Germany, Angela Merkel at the time, and the head of France, Francois Hollande, said that explicitly. It is sort of a ha 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 matter. So, I mean, put yourself in Putin's place and think about those military he's got breathing down his neck, and uh, you know, you wonder what what the next provocation will be, and whether Putin will say, "Well, it's all right, it's okay, we're winning in Ukraine, and we're going to show them we don't have to do anything more dramatic than what we're doing." Uh, so far. Putin has shown himself to be extremely perspicacious, in my view. Um, I don't think the West realizes that. Uh, they would like to provoke him and thinks he might be more easily provoked. But these next few months are very, very important. Putin himself says nothing's going to happen in the next couple of months. And the last thing I'll just add here is Viktor Orban from Ukraine. It was really an amazing spectacle. It all happened within the last week, okay? First, he goes to Ukraine and he says, hey, uh, Zelensky, how about, how about a ad hoc, uh, an impromptu ceasefire in place? You know, how would that work? Do we think we get things started then? And Zelensky checks with his patrons. It's no, no, that, that, no, no, we won't do that. So he goes to Moscow, he talks with Putin. Putin sees him for three hours, okay? They talk it through, okay? And uh, he asks Putin about this uh, immediate ceasefire. And uh, uh, Putin says, well, no, that wouldn't be enough. We need more than that. 
We need the Ukrainians to pull out of those four provinces, and we need a commitment to not to join NATO. I mean, well, well, that's pretty much what it is. And But, you know, at the press conference following Orban's uh, visit to Putin, it's very interesting because there is something going on here. I mean, I'm not saying Putin is putting Orban up to this. I think Orban is actually hoping to make some sort of deal for Europe to avoid war, okay? So what I'm saying is, here's the press conference, and somebody says, uh, President Orban, um, you raised this business about a, a, a ceasefire in place with uh, President Zelensky. Uh, what, how did he react? And Orban, very clever guy, uh, says, well, I told, I told President Putin. And so the reporter says, oh, President Putin. Uh, how, how can you can you elaborate on how Zelensky reacted to that proposal? And Putin says, "Yet, <laughs> no, <laughs> no." So what am I saying here? I'm saying that Putin could have said more, but there are things in play here. And when it was really quite amazing when Orban got on his private plane there in Moscow. He was interviewed, and uh, the German interviewer was going over what just happened. And Orban says, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, you ought to see where I'm going next. And the German interviewer, where are you going next? I can't tell you. Check the radio tomorrow morning. <laughs> He's in Beijing the next morning. Okay. Talks with Xi Jinping. Okay. Now, uh, the fact that this impromptu thing where Putin gives him three hours, Xi Jinping, I don't know how many hours, maybe half an hour, okay? But he's talked to Zelensky and Putin and uh, uh, Xi Jinping. Then he comes to New York for the NATO thing. He talks to Erdogan of Turkey. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'll bet his people are saying to the White House, you know, you really ought to talk to this guy. He's talked to all the main players now see what he thinks, and uh, it might be a little bit be embarrassing to be odd man out here. I mean, they go chief leaders, and you know, do you want to be in the position of dusting off this person who's trying to get some peace going, or at least says he's trying to get some peace going? Well, <laughs> I'm sure that happened. I mean, that always happened, but he was flipped away, and the rest of the story is equally interesting. He goes down to Mar-a-Lago in, in Florida, and he meets with Trump. Uh, Trump is a big fan of Orban's and vice versa. So that too is the pervasive reality in all this. Most people think that Trump is going to win. And uh, I hold no brief for President Trump or prior President Trump for the fact that he might win again. But think about the Europeans. Think about what's at stake for them, having put all this stuff in NATO and what he said about NATO. And, uh, you know, I don't buy the notion that he's in Putin's pocket. He clearly isn't. But Putin is willing to say, well, actually not willing to say, Putin said. Here it is, yeah. Some things I, I put down so I don't paraphrase and maybe make a mistake, okay? Um, he's at a Q&A on the 4th of July. It's not a holiday for them, okay? <laughs> and he's asked about, hey, did you understand what Trump said about uh, readiness to stop the war in Ukraine? Here's the question. Oh, here's the answer from Putin. Quote, we take Trump's readiness to stop the war in Ukraine quite seriously. How he's going to do this is the key question. But, but I have no doubt that he says it sincerely and we support it. Okay. He says it sincerely and we support it. Well, that doesn't mean that Trump checked it out with him. I'm sure that would be really hard bargaining. But Putin is not going to be put in a position of rejecting these things outright. I said, what, you know, I'm not sure how he's going to do this, but, uh, you know, ipso facto, I'm open to suggestion. 
And I'm sure that when Orban goes back to Budapest and uh, checks with his foreign ministry, there'll be a very hot exchange between Budapest and Moscow, uh, depending on what, what Orban heard from Trump. So again, that is a perversive reality here. Uh, and it's guiding not only what, uh, what is impelling uh, Biden and company to do these drastic things, like with Germany, but it's also informing the NATO people that they have to either throw their their weight fully, hundred percent in behind Obama, which all of them have, especially the Germans again. And what kind of what kind of things they might resort to to make sure that Trump doesn't win? Uh, it boggles the mind. But there's so much at stake for them politically and personally if Trump comes in and and and, and has the diffident notion toward. NATO that that he has exhibited in the past.